Welcome one and all to uh, the 2023 Salamander Crossing Brigade Workshop put on by the Harris Center for Conservation Education. I'm Brett Thielen. I'm the science director with the Harris Center and here with me tonight is Karen Siever, our staff ecologist. Um, Karen, do you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. Happy spring. So glad you all are here tonight to help some of the coolest critters around. Yes, so Karen and I uh, co-coordinate the Salamander Brigades on behalf of the Harris Center. The Harris Center for Conservation Education is a nonprofit organization based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire, where we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education for all ages. Um, if you are local to us, we always like to share we've protected more than 25,000 acres of land. Um, from development. Much of that is open for hiking, birding, salamander searching, and other recreation. We coordinate conservation research projects on those conserved lands and throughout the region, including the project you're going to hear about tonight, which is really our flagship community science project. And at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages, from babies and backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. We have um, we offer more than 100 events for the general public every year, um, in, in addition to our work in local schools. And we just uploaded all of our great spring events to the Harris Center's online calendar. So I definitely encourage you to check us out. We have everything from guided hikes to birding outings to film showings to Zoom talks. Um, so for friends near and far, there's lots of ways to learn about nature with the Harris Center. Um, and one last thing is none of what we do would be possible without the support of our donors. So I know some of you are out there. So thank you for your support. And if you're not a Harris Center supporter yet, I really encourage you to check us out. We have um, so much wonderful stuff going on. So with that, we're going to turn to the main attraction for tonight, which is um, talking about the Salamander Crossing Brigades. And I really um, encourage you to think of tonight um, as an invitation to one of the most magical parts of the natural year, the spring amphibian migration, um, sometimes known as big night. We'll talk about what that means, but it is um, like stepping into another world. And we're going to um, share with you tonight a little bit about that world and how you can help. An outline of what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the amphibian migration. What is it? When does it happen? Um, just the ecology surrounding that. We're going to get into some species identification. So talk about how to identify the different species you might see out there on these migration nights, how to tell one from another. We're gonna talk about why amphibians matter. So even if you decide after attending this talk that rainy nights are not your thing and you don't think you're gonna be volunteering with the Salamander Brigades after all, I'm hoping that you'll leave with a newfound appreciation for the role amphibians play in our ecosystems and that you'll leave with some great information so that you can be an advocate for amphibians in your communities. We're gonna talk some of the nuts and bolts, how the crossing brigades work. Um, tips for finding crossings. This will be particularly of, of interest for those of you who are further afield, who might be zooming in from other places and want to bring this back to your communities. How do you find out where to go? Uh, a special project for those of you who are more local looking at um, salamander spot pattern information, and then some of the successes uh, that have come out of this project. So with that, we're going we're gonna to dig right in to the myth of big night. This is a myth that environmental educators love to tell. And it goes something like this. Um, it starts in the winter when it's cold and snowy and long and, and everyone is desperate for spring. And slowly the snow melts and the days warm and the soil thaws. And then one day it starts to rain. And that rain continues all day and all afternoon and all night. And on that one big night, all of the spotted salamanders and all of the wood frogs and all of the spring peepers and all of the Jefferson salamanders clamber up from the underground burrows where they spent the winter. And on that one big night, they migrate across the landscape to vernal pools 
and other wetlands to breed. And it all happens on one big night. So we call this myth big night. And the magic behind the myth is real. The migration, the thousands of animals marching across the landscape all at once. It's true. It happens like that. The, the reason I call it a bit of a myth is that it almost never happens on one night each year. Um, in our um, 17 years of doing this project, we've, we've, we've never had a year with just one big night. We usually have one or two big nights, maybe even more, some medium-sized nights, some small nights. Um, this happens over the course of um, a few nights each spring, typically six to 10. Um, and before we move on, I just want to show this. This picture is our, our poster child species, the spotted salamander. My friend Dave took this photo on a migration night. And what I love the most about this photo is that you can see that this animal is still caked with mud. This is an animal that has just emerged from underground um, for its migration. And, and the, the, the mud is still stuck to its face and its body. And I just love that because it shows, yes, these animals spend 95% of their lives underground. And these few big nights of the year, um, or medium nights or small nights are our best chance to see them because the rest of the time they are living in the earth. So the reason it doesn't happen typically on just one big night is because this is a completely weather dependent phenomenon. And um, every year, the question that I get asked the most is when will the salamanders migrate? And I wish, I, I desperately wish I could tell you April 15th, don't miss it, put it on your calendars. Um, but it just doesn't work that way. This is a weather dependent phenomenon. And so a certain um, suite of things have to come together just right in order for a migration to happen. And so here's what we're looking for when we are um, wondering when migrations might come. This is what we're, this is where we are right now. Uh, we're looking for thawed ground. So these animals, these early spring migrants, they spend their winter under the forest floor. And so even if above ground conditions are perfect, if the ground is still frozen, they won't get the message. And so this is, this is the part of the year where we are right now. Some parts of the Monadnock region are still buried under a foot or more of snow. Other parts, the, the ground is starting to emerge, but will it thaw enough before the next warm rain to really spur amphibians to action? That's a good question. Warm nighttime temperature. So in this case, warm means 40 degrees or above. That's the cutoff we typically use. Sometimes some of these animals will move uh, with temperatures in the high 30s, but you won't get a lot of movement until it's in the 40s. Um, and that's because these are amphibians are ectotherms or cold blooded. Their body temperatures mirror that of their surroundings. And so if it's much before 40, they're moving really slow or not at all. 45 degrees, perfect. And then rain. I have a little asterisk here because that um, is highly variable and there's lots of different variations on rain. So a classic big night is 45 degrees, steady rain all night. Um, as you all know, uh, in the Northeast, spring weather is fickle and changes on a dime. And so we've had migrations on nights where it was started raining and then it stopped, but the ground was still wet. So some critters still moved or we went a long dry spring and never got good rain, but we had a really good misty, foggy night and it was wet enough to spur some of the wood frogs to action. So there's a little bit of um, flexibility on, on rain, but ideally what they want is rain and they will also settle for other wet weather. So these are the three things that we're looking for um, to come together that will spur an amphibian migration. So the other question, of course, uh, this whole project, the Salamander Crossing Brigades, is, is focused on helping amphibians cross roads. So why are they crossing roads? Um, so we've talked about already that this is a migration. This is a breeding migration. And so I think many of us, when we first think of the word migration, what comes to mind is birds moving thousands of miles you know, between their winter and summer habitats. This is not such a long distance migration. These animals are typically migrating uh, less than a quarter mile, but in my opinion, it's equally as spectacular because of, of just the amount of energy um, and the profusion of life moving across the landscape in early spring. But they are migrating from the woodlands where they've spent the winter and where they spend most of the rest of their time 
to vernal pools and other wetlands to court and lay eggs. And the reason that they cross roads is because on our modern landscape, there are often now roads in between the woods where they live and the wetlands where they breed. And so they need to cross that road to get to the wetland. They need to cross that road to leave the wetland too. So um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the species who, who are out there on these rainy spring nights. And we're gonna start with our poster child, the spotted salamander. Um, we call this the salamander brigades because of this animal. They are hard to mistake for anything else. They are spectacular. They're eight to 10 inches long. So large salamanders. They have bright yellow polka dots. Uh, you really can't mistake them for any other species when you see them. Um, as I said, they spend 95% of their lives underground. So these big nights are one of the best chances to see them. And they're long lived. They can live more than 20 years, up, up to 30 or so if they're not eaten by a barred owl or hit by a car. Um, and so that's also part of what plays into this big night is that they return year after year to the same wetlands to breed and these patterns emerge on the landscape. Um, but, but spotted salamanders are, are the kind of um, power animal that everybody's hoping to see on big night. And they also have incredible smiles that are very charming and endearing. And um, the first time you see one, you instantly fall in love. So in the early spring, um, in addition to spotted salamanders, this is, um, we have, there's, a, there's three species that we see most often in early spring. Spotted salamander is one. This one is the second, the wood frog. These frogs are um, smaller than the palm of your hand. And the thing that is most distinctive about them, the way that you know you are looking at a wood frog um, is that they're brown or tan or orangey in color, but that they also have this dark brown mask behind each eye, call it a bandit's mask. That is distinctive for wood frogs. And that's how you tell if you have a wood frog. Um, and once they um, begin their migration, typically for a lot of these species, the males migrate first. The first few nights of the season might be males moving to the, the vernal pools and the other wetlands. Once they get there, uh, the male wood frogs start to sing. And they might do that for several weeks on warm afternoons and through the night. And their singing sounds like this. It's also quite distinctive. You hearing that okay? Yeah, awesome. So they, they sound like ducks, but they're not ducks. This is wood frogs cracking. Um, they get quite a racket going. And it's one of the, the lovely sounds of spring. Um, every once in a while, we'll get a call at the Harris Center and someone will wonder why they heard uh, a whole bunch of ducks in the middle of the woods. It wasn't ducks, it was wood frogs. Uh, and this picture is to remind me to tell you about their superpower, which is that wood frogs survive the winter by freezing solid. Um, so they produce a kind of natural antifreeze that protects their internal organ, and then more than 50 or 60% of their bodies freeze their heart stops beating, their lungs stop breathing, and they just wait in suspended animation to thaw back out again and spring back to life. And that really comes into play um, early in, in our amphibian season because it also means that they are um, able to overwinter just a few inches below the surface of the forest floor. And so they're usually one of the first uh, animals to get the message that spring is here and um, and, and to kind of come up, come up above ground on these, these first few migration nights. Spotted salamanders cannot survive freezing. So they need to overwinter below the freeze line, which could be more than four feet deep. So sometimes in the early spring, we'll have wood frogs out and about uh, a week or two or more before the salamanders um, come to the surface. Our third of the big three that we see in early spring is this frog. And you're going to tell me in the chat what it is once you hear the sound it makes. So if you know this one, you can pop your guess in the chat. Yeah, people got it. The spring peeper, the sound of spring. This animal um, is a small frog, no bigger than the tip of your thumb. It has one of the largest sound volume to body mass ratios of any critter, which means it's very small and makes a lot of noise. Um, and they make a lot of peeps. 
So they've um, been recorded at more than three to 4,000 peeps an hour for several hours a night, more than 13,000 peeps in a single night. I don't, I don't envy the person who had to count all that. Um, and they've been recorded at more than 120 decibels, which is like a jackhammer uh, at close range. So it's really quite amazing that this huge noise comes from this tiny frog. Uh, in terms of how to know if you're looking at one, big nights are a really great chance to see them. They're otherwise incredibly well camouflaged and small. Um, so the first hint that you're seeing a peeper is its size, that it's about the size of the tip of your thumb or smaller. Um, some of them, they tend to be tan or yellowish um, or brownish in color, orangey. Some of them have this cross on their back. That's where they get their scientific name, Pseudacris crucifer, cross. Um, but they don't all have a very distinctive cross. So I mostly am looking for size and also the presence of suction cups or toe pads on the end of each of their toes. That's because they climb vertical surfaces. They're a tree frog species. And so um, that helps us know we're seeing a peeper. Suction cup toes, small size, tan or brown in color. And here's a, um, a picture for scale. This is a full grown adult peeper. It's as big as they get. So those are the three that we see at most of our sites. Um, at some sites, um, including in Keene and in Westmoreland, we have a fourth early spring amphibian species. It's a relative of the spotted salamander. It's in the same family, which are collectively known as the mole salamanders because of all the time they spend underground. Um, and that's this one here, the Jefferson salamander. You can see they don't have bright yellow spots. Instead, they have pale blue flecking on a light gray skin. Um, they also um, are a little smaller than spotties. So while spotties are six to eight inches long, these are 10, or I mean, eight to 10 inches long, Jefferson's are tend to be five to seven. Um, they have very long toes and they also have a tail that is more like a rudder, really flat. Um, and they have a relative, the blue spotted salamander that is um, a little bit darker gray with brighter blue flecking. And in places where they coexist, including New Hampshire and most of the Northeast, they frequently hybridize. And you can't tell from looking whether you have a blue spotted salamander, a Jefferson salamander, or a hybrid. You'd have to do genetic testing if you wanted to figure that out. And so even though you might hear me referring to Jefferson salamanders, usually what I mean there is Jefferson complex salamanders or the hybrid. Um, we assume that that's what we have. And they're a really interesting species. These hybrids um, have all female lineages that clone themselves. So um, there's a whole, whole bunch of scientists studying the genetics of that, but um, our Jefferson salamanders are um, a species of conservation need, greatest conservation need here in New Hampshire. They are less common and therefore we really only have them at a few sites. So it's really special if you see them, we encourage you to take a picture and to share it with us um, so that we can report those to New Hampshire Fish and Game for their records. So as spring wears on uh, and temperatures warm, we have other players who are out and about on rainy nights who are not necessarily uh, in the midst of a breeding migration, but might just be dispersing or foraging just enjoying the wet weather. Um, and all of the, the salamanders on this page are, are more or less pinky size, pinky finger size. They're much smaller than the mole salamanders, which are large and, and quite distinctive for their size. Um, the first one here, I'm sure that is familiar to many of you. Um, this is the one in the top uh, left corner here. It's bright orange. It's probably the first animal you think of when someone says salamander. Um, so this is the red eft or Eastern newt. They're pretty distinctive, bright orange. They've got that those lines of spots that are outlined by um, black. And this is the reason that many of us think of this when we hear of salamanders is because they're one of our only diurnal or day active salamander species that is also active above ground. So we see them on, on wet summer days roaming around in the woods. These are the juvenile form of the Eastern newt. They're both the same species. Um, as juveniles, as red Fs, they have bright orange skin, thick skin, they're terrestrial. They live on land for up to two to seven years wandering through the woods. And then at some point they undergo a transition and their skin gets thin so that they can better absorb oxygen through it. It changes color to that olive green, although you'll see that they keep their orange spots. Um, their tail changes shape to be better for swimming. 
and they uh, embrace a, a nearly fully aquatic life living in lakes, ponds, and beaver wetlands um, as the adult newts. And they can spend another 10 years that way. We don't see the adults on big nights because they don't really come out of the ponds that much. But we And we don't see a ton of the red Fs either because they're mostly day active and we're out there at night. But uh, sometimes at the edges of the day, when we're just getting out there for the night, we'll see um, a few Fs out there. The next one is our most common, not just our most common salamander, but our most common vertebrate. So there are more of these than any other animal with a backbone in northeastern forests. There's more redback salamanders than mice, than toads, than chipmunks, than chickadees. Um, they are, again, kind of pinky size, about half as wide maybe as your pinky. Their distinctive um, identifying characteristic is that red stripe that runs down their back, and also they have very small legs. Um, these are the ones you might see in your wood pile or under logs if you uh, like to turn over logs in the woods and poke around a bit. The next one, our four-toed salamander. We don't have this at all our sites, but we do have it at a few. This is a swamp salamander that likes to hang out in sphagnum moss. So if you have a crossing site with a wetland, um, that's where you might find four toads. They're named because they have four toes on each of their rear feet in addition to their front feet. I do not recommend attempting to count their toes however, because they are very small and hard to see, and there's easier ways to identify them. Namely, that they have this kind of constriction at the base of their tail. It's like an hourglass shape. That's related to uh, an incredible thing that these and other some other salamander species do, which is that they can detach their own tails and leave them wriggling there to distract predators while they escape um, and then regrow a whole new tail. Um, so, that's pretty incredible. Um, and so that constriction is, is where the tail would detach. Uh, they also have a black and white speckled belly. So that's another key feature for four-toed salamanders. So if you're at a site near a swamp or a wetland with a lot of um, moss in it, and you find an animal with an hourglass kind of shaped tail at the base and black and white belly, that could be a four-toed. And the last salamander that we occasionally see, this is also not necessarily um, a breeding migration. This is a stream salamander. It likes cold brooks, um, but we do see them at some of our sites. Um, this one is distinctive for the yellowish coloration and the two black lines running parallel down its back, which gives it its name, the two-line salamander. So these are all kind of our small salamanders. And the most common one you'll see is the red-backed, but the other ones occur from time to time. All of these are on amphibian ID sheets that you can download at harriscenter.org as well, um, and that are a part of our volunteer handbook. So if you didn't take, if you're busily, busy, busy scribbling notes, um, there's resources to, to help you remember. In terms of frogs, we also have um, more and more species that come out in spring and even in summer as, it, as we have these warm rainy nights. The first one is up on the left here. This, is, this does have a breeding migration. This is a frog that lives in bark. It looks like bark. It eats insects that live in bark. And this is our gray tree frog. So color can vary widely from green to light gray to dark gray, but the distinctive th and the size can, can change quite a bit from juveniles who are the same size as peepers up to something almost the palm of your hand. But the key characteristics here are that that really bumpy skin, and they also have these suction cup toes, the toe pads for climbing trees. That's our gray tree frog. They're adorable as well. Uh, this uh, next one is uh, um, a frog of more permanent wetlands and water bodies. It is often mistaken for a leopard frog, which are quite uncommon in our neck of the woods. Um, but this is the pickerel frog. So the distinctive thing here are those rectangular boxy shaped spots. And they also, um, in breeding season, the males have a, a yellow groin there. So leopard frogs have much more round spots that are more sparse. and Pickerel frogs have these kind of two rows of really boxy rectangular shaped spots. That's how you know you've got a pickerel frog. Uh, and the bottom two look very similar. They are frogs of more, again, more permanent lakes and ponds, but they forage out and about on wet, warm nights. They're both green in color. Um, and we've got our green frog and our bullfrog. 
So I always like to, to remind people that if you find a frog in New Hampshire and it weighs five pounds, it is a bullfrog. They can get huge, far bigger than any other frog that we have here in this state. However, we all start out small and smaller um, bullfrogs might look very, might closely resemble green frogs. And so there's another way to tell besides their green color, um, which is to look at their back. So green frogs have two ridges running down their back. They're called dorsolateral ridges. Wood frogs have these two. Bullfrogs don't have any of those ridges on their back. Their back doesn't have that same kind of structure. So that's my go-to, how to tell if I'm looking at a green frog or a bullfrog. Um, I know some people like to look at their the, the color of the green on their upper lip or the way that the folds um, go around their, their these drums, eardrums here, but I find the back is the easiest way to tell. Ridges, green frog. No ridges, bullfrog. Um, and one last species that's kind of in a class all its own. I'm sure you, many of you are familiar with this species. This is the American toad. It is stout. It is war, warty. It is grumpy looking all the time and um, can range in color from tan to brown to kind of an orange shape. The females can look more orangey. Um, it's a, it can walk. Many of our other frogs will hop or leap and toads hop as well, but they also often on these nights, you'll see them walking out and about. Um, they are, um, they also have a breeding migration late in the season. So we tend to see them more like mid to late April and into May. So that's kind of our rundown of our species. I, a couple that can sometimes be confused with each other. So here we have two species that both have bumpy, warty looking skin, the gray tree frog and the American toad. They're also often migrating um, in great numbers on the same warm nights in late April. Um, the things to look for here are their stature. So toads have a real upright posture a lot of the time. They're real stout. Um, and gray tree frogs are, are often trying to camouflage themselves by plastering themselves as flat as they possibly can uh, along the ground. Um, and also uh, the coloring is different. Gray tree frogs tend to be gray or greenish in color, whereas toads are more brownish or orange. And then the toes. So toads have pointy toes for hopping and walking and gray tree frogs have those toe pads or suction cup toes for climbing trees. So those are the differences for those two. Gray tree frogs and peepers can sometimes be confused for one another because they both have those suction cup toes, but their skin is really different and their coloring is quite different. So gray tree frogs, again, look like bark, super bumpy, um, and also maybe grayish or greenish in color. Spring peepers, really smooth skin, more tan or yellow or orangey in color. And lastly, um, Wood frogs grow to be much bigger than spring peepers, but we do occasionally see small wood frogs and large peepers. Um, and so for those two, the thing I always look for, if I see a brownish colored frog is, does it have that dark mask behind its eye? If it does, no matter what size it is, in our neck of the woods, it's a wood frog. Spring peepers don't have that. And then also, if you want confirmation, you can check out their toes again, because peepers have the toe pads and wood frogs have pointy toads. Um, pointy toes. And that wood frogs also have those ridges on their back, which peepers don't have. So um, I will be quizzing you later on all of these to test your knowledge. Um, but what if after all that, you still can't tell, like, what is this? So this is a picture that was sent to us from our Forest Lake Road Crossing many years ago. And it's a really weird looking salamander. And Deb, who was out there, um, wasn't sure what it was. So the first thing is, if you can't tell what species it is, and you're at a site where there's a site coordinator, we're going to talk about what that means in a bit, you can ask them because they've really boned up on their amphibian ID and are there to help, and they'll also have some laminated ID sheets that you can consult. If there is no site coordinator, or if they're not sure, then you can take a picture and send it to me, and um, Karen and I will take a look at it, and we will help ID it. In this case, uh, I sent this picture around to a lot of people because I wasn't really sure what we were looking at either. And the concept, because there is a salamander that we haven't talked about tonight um, that is much less common, that is, an, um, in fact, incredibly rare in New Hampshire, um, called the marbled salamander that has these marbled blotches on its back. And we wondered, is this a... Um, 
a hybrid of a spotted salamander and a marbled salamander. And the general consensus was that it was just a really, a spotted salamander with really weird spots. That's what we kind of came, came along to, but we love to talk about these things. So if you have um, interesting pictures to share, send them in and, and we'll help ID them to the best of our ability. All right, so before we move on past the species idea, are there any pressing questions, Karen, that we should address about species? Yes, I've got two for you. Um, the first one was from Michelle Landry. Michelle's wondering if it's typical to hear uh, wood frogs and peepers calling before a big night. She lives near a wetland and feels like she hears them uh, before the migrations begin. That's a really interesting question. I would say, um, yes, occasionally you might hear individual peepers peeping or wood frogs croaking. Uh, it's not common and you won't necessarily hear chorusing of many of them doing that all at once, but individuals will sometimes be tricked by spring-like weather. Um, it's probably more likely if you, if you live near a wetland and you're hearing them that a migration may have happened while you um, were asleep, or maybe there was a little bit of rain in the middle of the night. Sometimes wood frogs in particular will get very impatient and will migrate even if you've never got a good soaking rain. They're a little bit more tolerant of dry conditions. Um, so in our first nights of the season are very quiet because they haven't mostly migrated yet, the, the singers. Um, and then a few nights in, we start to really get serenaded by all the males who've, who've migrated into those wetlands and are singing. Um, but the first night or two out on the road is, is usually quite quiet. All right, and one more. Um, Aaron Anthony was wondering about red Fs and if they are capable of breeding. Um, Aaron has noticed some association between um, adult newts and Fs. And mm -hmm is wondering what's going on there. My, my guess, I don't know for sure. My guess is that is that it takes them some time to transition from their juvenile phase and the way they look as juveniles to the way they look as adults. And that probably what you're seeing are maybe, um, juveniles that are just starting that transition and, and have, you know, are maybe in the, in the, in the wetland, in the lake, in the pond, but haven't fully embraced their new adult identities yet is my guess is what you're seeing there. That was my guess too. And all right. All for now, if people have more questions, I've been attending to some, and if, if I can't answer them, I'll pitch them to Brett later. Awesome. All right. So now we're going to move into our kind of, so what um, part of the presentation, why should we care about amphibians? This is the information I'm hoping you'll take with you um, into your communities. Even if you decide you don't want to come out on these big nights, that you'll still recognize the value that these animals um, have in our in our ecosystems. And the first uh, thing we want to talk about with regards to this is the concept called a concept of biomass. This is a way that scientists have of kind of calculating um, the relative importance of different species within an ecosystem and, and the way that energy moves through an ecosystem in the bodies of plants and animals. And it's there's like it's a it's a number, it's a, a way of quantifying this. And so at its most um, simplistic you calculate biomass by taking the mass of an individual uh, and then by multiplying that by the number of individuals or adding that to the mass of all the other individuals in a given uh, of a given species at a given place in time. So for instance, if I wanted to calculate the biomass of human beings in the Harris Center building, I would have take my mass, I would add that to Karen's mass, I would add that to Phil Brown's mass and Susie Spickle's mass and all the Harris Center staff and visitors and I'd get a number. And then if I wanted to compare that to the biomass of mice or ants in the Harris Center building, um, I would get a different number and I would compare them and it might really surprise me because although mice and ants are quite small, they tend to be very numerous. And so biologists have done this looking at forested ecosystems and looking specifically at amphibians and forested ecosystems. There's this classic study out of the Hubbard Brook Forest here in New Hampshire from the 70s, where they looked just at redback salamanders, just that one uh, pinky sized salamander that you see in your wood pile. And they found that the biomass of redback salamanders was twice that of all bird species combined in that forest um, during peak breeding season. 
And uh, more current research is showing that that's actually um, maybe a significant underestimate of the biomass of redback salamanders in our forests. So what does that mean? It means that there's an incredible amount of energy moving through our forest and wetland ecosystems in the bodies of these animals. And that really plays out in the food web. They are important prey for herons and hawks and owls and snakes and turtles and raccoons and coyotes and minks and um, nearly everything you can think of will eat amphibians if given a chance. Um, before I talk about this slide, this is a pop quiz. What species do we have here? So notice that this is small, sitting on the tip of a thumb, but it also has a really distinctive um, feature on its head. Yes, some of you are guessing wood frog, right? So we've got that dark bandit's mask. Even this is a this is a, a froglet, a new a newly emerged wood frog just out of the vernal pool, but it still has that dark bandit's mask. So well done. Um, so it's not uncommon for a small vernal pool to produce more than 10,000 of these froglets. And if they're lucky, 10 will make it to adulthood. The rest are food. And on the flip side of things, they're also incredibly important predators of insects and other invertebrates. So an American toad can eat three times its own weight in bugs in a single day in the growing season, more than 10,000 invertebrates in a season. Um, spotted salamander larvae, voracious, voracious predators of mosquito larvae and other aquatic invertebrates and vernal pools. So if we lost our amphibians, we would lose really important connections in our forest and wetland food webs. They're also very sensitive. So they're really good um, signals for us. Their skin is porous and is, is very sensitive to toxins, pollutants in the environment, um, disease. So they can be real sentinels of what's going on in the world. And in fact, they already are serving this role. This map is um, sadly outdated. It hasn't been updated since 2008. Um, the IUCN is in the process of updating it now, but it's taking them many years. So um, I keep looking for a new one and it's still in process. But this is a map showing um, threaten the number of amphibian species worldwide that are threatened or presumed extinct. So these ones with the red and orange and yellow, you're talking 19 to 42 species of amphibians that are threatened or presumed extinct in certain parts of the world. That's more species than we have here in New Hampshire. Um, and worldwide, we've got about 50% of our salamanders and newts that are threatened or presumed extinct and about a third of our frogs and toads. They're really struggling in many places due to habitat loss, fragmentation, um, of course, climate change, disease, pollutants. But we are fortunate in that we live in an area that that um, does not have a very bright color on this map. And we still have a, a many common species and a chance to help keep them common. So that's what, um, and they face many threats, but the one we're talking about tonight is this one, roadkill, road mortality. Um, so if I ask you to, to tell me what, what animals do you think of when I say the word roadkill, throw a few of the animals in the chat. What do you think of when someone says roadkill to you? Raccoons, yep. Mammals, skunks, fox, squirrels. So right, so we're thinking of animals that tend to be get hit one at a time and they're kind of large bodied. So their bodies stay on the side of the road where we can see them for a while. Um, the scientific literature is showing that despite the, 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 the higher visibility of all those mammals, that it's reptiles and amphibians that are suffering the most from road mortality. More than 90% of vertebrate road kills are reptiles and amphibians. And we just don't see it um, because if you think about when are amphibians most active, rainy nights. So most of us are not out on those nights. In addition, amphibians are small and soft bodied. So, um, Few passing cars go by and they're kind of crushed beyond recognition or they're scavenged um, before morning by crows. It's a, it's a um, pattern that's largely invisible to us, but it's becoming more and more documented um, in science. There's some incredible studies that just made my jaw drop. This one from Canada, they looked at a two mile stretch of road over four seasons and documented more than 30,000 dead amphibians. 
Another study from New York found that in their best case scenario at that site, one out of every two salamanders made it across a paved rural road, just like the ones most of us drive every day. Um, in Massachusetts, they found that they could lose their spotted salamander populations in as few as 25 years due just to roadkill. Think about these big nights. There are thousands of animals on the road over the span of a single night. When you have that concentration of uh, amphibians in one place, it does not take a lot of cars to do a lot of damage. Um, not all roads are created equal. The places where this is happening most is roads near water. This is true for amphibians. It's also true for snakes and turtles. And traffic volume matters too. So um, a dirt road with one or two houses on it is probably not a huge threat. Um, and a major highway probably lost its amphibian population a long time ago. So the places where, the, where this is really playing out right now are these kind of typically paved rural roads. Oh, and I have a little pop quiz here. I hope you all know this species, but what species do we have in this picture sitting on a road? This is sitting on North Lincoln Street in particular. Um, yes, we got our spotted salamander, the bright yellow polka dots. Unmistakable. So there are solutions. That, that was the sad part. This is the happy part. There are, there are solutions. This is a problem with good solutions. Um, first and foremost, that the most effective solution are tunnels uh, with fencing to guide animals under the road. These are most effective because they're available to amphibians at all times. Um, they're available to them as they move towards the wetland, as they move away from the wetland, as the young come out of the wetland. Um, and they're effective, they work. There's, this is a picture that doesn't look like much, but it's pretty exciting to me. This is a, um, a trail cam photo from one of the underpasses that was put in in Moncton, Vermont in 2016 after 10 years of working on this project. Um, that's one of the first spotted salamanders to cross um, through the Moncton tunnel. That first season they documented more than 2,200 amphibians using the two tunnels that they put in. This was a site that has thousands of amphibians migrating, including some rare species. And this um, is a hugely successful project and inspiration to many of us um, who think about these things. The downside is that it was very expensive. It costs more than $400,000 from soup to nuts for a project like this. And that's just not possible at every site. Um, so a more cost-effective solution, it's less effective because it, um, it's, it's not available to amphibians all the time, and it depends on people to pre accurately predict a migration. But many communities um, are implementing uh, road closures on migration nights. So this is a picture from Beekman Road in East Brunswick, New Jersey. There's a community in Philadelphia that does this for toads. We do this now here in Keene, New Hampshire, which um, I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so this is you're not going to protect every amphibian this way, but if you close the roads on the, the nights that the greatest probability for the greatest number of animals on the road, um, you can offer some really great protection for them um, for a lot less money than building a tunnel. But before you can think about tunnels or road closures, you need to know where are these road crossings happening, how many amphibians are involved, which species are involved, um, it probably doesn't make sense to close a road or put a tunnel in for a road that has 10 frogs crossing it in a night or even 100 frogs crossing it in a night. But when you get into 1,000 frogs a night, that's a different story. And so how do we collect this information um, that we can use for these long-term conservation solutions? That's where the salamander crossing brigades come in and where you come in if you, if you want to join us. Um, so now we're going to talk about how the salamander brigades work unless there are questions about our um, amphibian conservation piece that are um, we don't want to wait on. Is there anything, Karen? No. Okay. We're going to dive into the salamander brigades. This is what you all are here for. So what are the salamander brigades and what do the salamander crossing brigades do? So this is divided into kind of two time periods. There's before the big nights and then there's on the big nights. So before the big nights, the first thing we do is attend a training. So congratulations, you are halfway there. Um, you're already ahead of the game. After that, you are going to stay on call because we don't know exactly when a migration will happen. You're going to start to um, basically be waiting. And what does being on call mean? How do you find out when a big night will happen? So um, 
Uh, first thing is that if you are interested in this if, um, and you'd like to participate in the Monadnock region, you can go to our website. I'm going to walk us through the website in a little bit to show you where to find these things. But there's a link that says sign up to volunteer. And that will um, add you to our email list and um, also give us some information about where you might want to volunteer, what you're interested in in, in terms of geographic location. Um, and then we will email you when we think a migration is imminent. You are welcome to sign up for our list, even if you don't live in the Monadnock region, but we didn't wanna just automatically add everyone who signs up for this training to that list because we do have people joining us from all over the Northeast. And so um, sign up for our email list and we'll send, we'll start once we get into salamander season, we'll start to send out emails with salamander forecasts. And then after migrations, we'll also send out little field reports about what happened out there on those nights. Um, if you haven't heard from us or you don't want to sign up for the email list, we also keep a five-day salamander forecast on the Harris Center website. We update that almost every day during salamander season, which in Southwest New Hampshire runs from mid-March through early May. Um, we have a color-coded system here, red, yellow, green. I will tell you that we don't usually switch it to green until right before um, because things change so dramatically um, in the spring with spring weather in New England. And then we also underneath the color coded system have a little narrative that explains what are we looking at? Why, um, what might be different between Keene and Peterborough and other areas, especially this time of year when some areas are still blanketed with snow and other places have bare ground, there can be a lot of differences um, from site to site. But the salamander forecast is updated every day at harriscenter.org um, starting in late March and going through early May. And then if you live further afield, or even if you don't, you watch the weather. You're looking for the same things that I'm looking for, which is thawed ground, temperatures, nighttime temperatures in the 40s, and wet weather after dark. That's what we're looking for. So you're staying on call, and then you're getting your gear together while you're waiting. So what do you need to have um, with you or on you when you're out on big nights? So, oh, pop quiz. Okay, what species is this? You can throw it in the chat. Anybody? Yeah, wood frogs, dark brown bandix mask. That's classic, Keith. Okay, great, thank you. All right, when you go out, you should bring or wear. Here are the things, the very first thing is a reflective vest. This is a essential piece of safety equipment. It is so important that if you don't have a reflective vest or can't find your reflective vest, you should not go out on the road at night. It is absolutely essential for making sure that cars can see you. They are pretty inexpensive. You can purchase them at nearly any hardware store, a sporting goods store, of course, the internet for about 10 bucks. Um, if you live locally in the Monadnock region and cost is a barrier for you, we, we may have reflective vests that you can borrow. You can just drop Karen or I a line and our site coordinators often will have extra vests to lend um, for those sites as well. But it is so key. Do not go out without it. Next, rain gear. It will be raining. That is the whole point of big night. And you um, will be much more comfortable if you have not just a rain jacket, but also rain pants to keep you dry. Um, we also, um, I often will say that these are the first warm, rainy nights of spring, but warm to a wood frog who can literally freeze solid and survive is not the same thing as warm to a human being. And a couple of hours out in 43 degree temperatures can start to feel pretty chilly. So you really wanna bundle up for these nights. Um, another piece of essential equipment is at least one bright light for every person in your group. Cell phone flashlights, not good enough. They are not bright enough for big night. So you need, um, a, you need a light that can be visible to cars and that will also help you see critters before they're underfoot. Spot. Remember that spring peepers are the size of the tip of your thumb. If you don't have a bright light, it will be very hard to see them. So um, you could, so some people use headlamps, which are really great for looking at data forms and for being extra visible to passing cars. But really, when it, when you're looking for amphibians, nothing beats um, a good old fashioned handheld flashlight where you can direct the beam of light. Many of our volunteers use both, um, including me. 
And so they're really key piece and you want one for every person in your group. And before you head out, you want to make sure that they are charged up or that you have fresh batteries. Don't just grab the flashlight that's been sitting in your kitchen drawer for a year unused and expect that it will be good enough. Um, it's really frustrating to be out there with a light that is not bright enough to see um, all the critters in the road. Data forms. So if you go to a site where the site coordinator, we'll talk about that in a bit, they may have one for you, um, data forms for you. And those will be printed on what's called right in the rain paper, which has a waxy coating on it so that it doesn't completely disintegrate on, on, on a rainy night. But you cannot write on right in the rain paper with pen, only pencil. And even if you print your own data forms out at home, pencil just does better uh, in wet weather. A clipboard or notepad to lean on while you are. Um, keeping your counts, camera or phone, um, you are definitely going to want to take pictures of these incredible amphibians and share them with everyone that you know, because they are beautiful and amazing. And maybe you've never seen a spotted salamander before. Um, we also have a spot on our website where you can submit your photos to us. And if you do, we will um, assume that we have your permission to share them unless you say otherwise with our amphibian community through our field reports and um, on our website and sometimes on our social media. Um, it's really fun to see and share photos from these big nights with everyone. And so we love to do that. Um, but you need a way to, you know, you need a way to take those pictures and to make sure it's charged up. The last two things are optional um, and they require a little bit of explanation. Um, the first is um, a bucket. So at some sites on some nights, there are so many amphibians that it can be more efficient to use a bucket to carry a number of amphibians across the road at one time, rather than to carry them one at a time by hand. Um, some people um, will bring a bucket for this purpose. Other people don't want one more thing to carry, which um, is kind of the camp that I fall in, but other people like to have a bucket. If you bring a bucket, it is really important to make sure that it is clean, that it does not have any residue of household cleansers, bleach, grease, or any other kind of toxins that could be absorbed through amphibians skin it has to be clean. The next thing, um, is an, is something for, um, is something for dealing with dead amphibians. So if you go, if you go out here, um, if you go out on these nights long enough, eventually you're going to find an amphibian that um, has been killed by a passing car. It's the worst part of this. And um, when you do that, you have a choice. You can choose to ignore it and just focus your energy on helping the living. Many people do that. Um, but if you count it on your data form, we have a spot on our data form for live animals and a spot for dead animals. And if you count it on your data form, we ask that you remove it from the road. And that's because if we have five people passing by the same dead wood frog and they each record it on their form, we're going to think we have five dead wood frogs at that site when we really only had one. So if you count it, we ask that you remove it from the road. You can simply pick it up and, um, move it off the road, just like you would a live animal. Um, but some people don't like to touch the dead ones. And so they bring a scoop or a spatula or like a children's little um, a sandbox shovel to um, help them move the dead ones off the road. So that's um, all the stuff to bring or wear when you go out. So on these big nights, we've already started to talk about this. What are you doing? You are moving these animals across the road in the direction that they were heading when you found them. The goal of this program is to move animals across the road, or one of the goals anyway, is to move animals across the road faster than they can move themselves. So, um, but they know where they're going. In the beginning of the season, they're almost all going to be heading to the wetland. In the middle of the season, you're going to have some leaving the wetland. They've already laid their eggs. They're done for the year, and you're going to have some coming in. And at the end of the season, many of them will be leaving. And that's part of the way we know that the season is drawing to a close is when most of the animals are leaving. So you're moving them across the road. Um, oh, and then this is a chance to talk about handling amphibians. So how are you moving them? How do you pick them up? And we get a lot of questions from people who have heard that the oils on your hand can cause irreparable damage to amphibians and that you should never touch them. Um, this is a myth. Um, there's a few, there's a few, there's a few angles to that. One is that your hands, when handling an animal very briefly for the short time it takes to move them off the road, do far less damage than a car tire. So in this case, this is, um, I think, 
it, it certainly stresses them out to be handled and I don't encourage handling them for long amounts of time, but um, this is in service to a greater good. And, and if, you, if you go out there for enough nights, you'll see the damage that cars can do and you'll want these animals off the road as fast as possible. Um, but also it's not really the, the, the oils are, you know, the, the nature of your hands that, that causes harm, but it, there are things that we put on our hands that can cause harm to animals who are sensitive to toxins. So when you are handling amphibians, you want to make sure that their hands are clean. You can wash them with soap and water before you leave the house, that they're wet. Um, that happens pretty naturally on a rainy night, or you can stick your hands in a puddle when you first get there and free of toxins. So what's a toxin in this case? Um, bug spray, perfume, lotion, most importantly, hand sanitizer, no hand sanitizer when handling amphibians. That stuff is full of chemical additives that can be harmful for them. You don't need it on these nights. And if you have it on your hands, you shouldn't touch amphibians with them. Some people also opt to use nitrile gloves, non-powdered. That's a great option too. You can use gloves with these animals, um, you know, surgical, medical gloves, surgical gloves, non-powdered. Um, in addition, you want to think about how you're holding them. You can, you want to kind of keep a, a gentle, firm hold around the center of their bodies. You don't want to squeeze too hard, but you also don't want to hold them too loosely so that they, they wriggle out of your hands and fall from waist height. Um, with frogs, you can sometimes cup your hands together to keep them in there. Um, with salamanders, you can kind of hold them right around the center. Um, you do not want to hold them by their legs or their tails. Remember that part about how amphibians can detach their own tails if they are afraid of a predator? Well, we don't want them to see you as a predator because that costs them a lot of energy to have to regrow an entire limb and we don't want them to feel threatened in that way. So, um, and picking them up by their legs can cause injuries for them. And then when you release them on the other side of the road, just put them down gently. Don't drop them from waist height. Don't toss them. You don't need to teach them a lesson about the dangers of the road and kind of hassle them a little bit. Um, they need to cross that road and they're going to do it anyway. So the best thing is to just be as gentle with them as possible. Okay, so we're moving amphibians across the road. We're keeping count by species. Uh, and we're also keeping separate counts for live and dead animals. Uh, this is what our data form looks like. You can download these at harriscenter.org. We also have a smaller version that um, is like a mini, a quarter sheet that our site coordinators might hand to you if you don't want a whole big piece of paper. Um, that is that is just the basics on um, the amphibian counts. Tally marks work great, one, two, three, four. And then every fifth one you do a cross that enables you to count them up at the end of the night. We also have some questions about volunteer effort, start time, end time, weather conditions while you were out there. Um, you are going to report your data. So if you write on that data form and then you never share that information with us, um, we can't do anything with it. It, it kind of ends, it, it ends with you that night. But if you share your data with us, um, we can use it for conservation. And so um, sharing your data can be as simple as handing your data form to a site coordinator if you have one at your site when you leave, or just um, verbally telling them your counts if you want to keep your data form as a memento. Um, if your site doesn't have a site coordinator, um, which is going to be true for many sites, um, we have on online forms at harriscenter.org, we have one for your count data and we have one for photos, it's two separate forms. And we also have one for, for reporting crossing sites, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but they're online forms, they're really easy. I don't necessarily recommend filling them out in the field because it'll be raining and it'll be trying to fumble with your phone. But as soon as you get home or the very next morning, um, the sooner the better. The longer you wait, the less likely you are to actually do it, to actually like submit your data. Um, and we also, um, the longer you wait, the harder it is for us to kind of pull all that data together and get a report back out to the community. We try to do that within a week of each migration. Um, and so the sooner we get your information, the sooner we can uh, organize and manage the data and share it back out. So don't delay. Do it that night, preferably, or the next morning. Karen's our master data manager. I see her nodding her head because she's the one who is working with all that those counts. Um, and then your 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 biggest and um, biggest and most important responsibility is to stay safe. And in fact, one of the primary reasons we offer these trainings is to really talk about safety because um, being out on a road at night 
in the rain and fog when drivers may not be expecting to see people in the road is not an inherently safe activity. And so you're first and foremost, you need to um, pay attention to your own safety. So um, the first rule to staying safe is wear a reflective vest. I'm going to tell you this like four more times because it is so important. Do not go out without one. We have them um, that you can borrow if you live in the Monadnock region. And even if you live further afield, you can find them very inexpensively. They are worth it. This is um, part of my example. These were some interns a number of years ago. Could you see them if you were, um, if they were not wearing a reflective vest? The answer is no, you could not see them. It is so important to be visible to cars on these nights. Okay, so after you're wearing a reflective vest, again, we talked about this already, but your light should be bright. Cell phone flashlights are not good enough. You need a bright light so that cars can see you. It also is really key for being able to see amphibians and for not accidentally stepping on amphibians. Um, make sure it's charged, make sure you have fresh batteries, um, flashlight, headlamp, either, both, but something that is not a cell phone and one for every member of your party. Stay alert. So um, looking and listening for cars all the time. And if you hear one coming, just like if you were a kid that used to play games, you know, in the neighborhood and you call out car so everybody can hear you, um, really being alert to traffic at all times. When you're walking down the road, I recommend that you walk facing traffic. So walk down one lane facing traffic um, for the length of that crossing site, cross the road, walk the other way facing traffic. It'll give you a better sense for when cars are coming. And that's so, so important. When they come, step aside, step off the road. Don't attempt to stop traffic and don't shine your lights at cars, even if you're really mad because you know they saw you and they sped up or something like that. Um, we used to call ourselves salamander crossing guards. And we rebranded probably more than a decade ago now because what do crossing guards do? They stop traffic. Well, it's not safe for us to stop traffic. It's not legal for us to stop traffic. Um, and so what we are are crossing brigades who are moving animals faster than they can move themselves. And when cars are coming, we are stepping aside and not interfering with the flow of traffic. Just hands down. Um, this last one here sounds obvious, but I'm going to share a scenario with you that has happened to all of us who have spent nights on the roads. Um, and that is that you will be out there. You have maybe had your first experience of seeing a spotted salamander and you have fallen madly in love and you just want to do everything you can for these incredible animals. And you will hear a car coming and you'll step aside um, and as that car is coming, you're going to look in the headlights of that car because they are brighter than any flashlight you could ever have. And it will give you a sense of what's, what's in the road. And there will come a time when you see a salamander or a frog illuminated in the headlights of that car. And the first thing that you're going to think probably, if you're like me, is I can run out there really quick and grab that salamander before the car gets here. The next thing I want you to hear in your head is my voice saying, don't do it. Don't do it. it. There are so many things that could go wrong. It is wet out there. It is slick. You could slip. The salamander could wriggle out of your hands. Um, you can't run or do anything quickly on these nights. And it is not worth the safety risk to your health. You just have to let the car pass by, um, hope for the best. And then when the car is gone, go out and tend to that animal. Do not risk your life for amphibians, as wonderful as they are. Um, for families, uh, there's a few other things you need to think about. Um, this is a powerful and, and transformative experience for kids. It can be, but it is not an inherently um, safe activity in all circumstances. So um, our advice for families, leave very young children at home. So we're, we're, we're talking that this is best suited for elementary age and up. Um, young children who are prone to dart out um, or don't know how to be safe around traffic or might get really excited and be hard to kind of wrangle, um, leave them at home for now or bring them to North Lincoln Street when that road is closed, which is a safer place for them to be. We'll talk about that. 
do some research ahead of time. Um, we will talk about crossing sites. We have a list of them on our website, but some sites are more family friendly than others, meaning that they have better lighting or slower traffic or wide shoulders. And we have information on our website about which sites are more family friendly. For our well-established crossings, it's North Lincoln Street in Keene, it's Glebe Road in Westmoreland, Forest Lake Road in Winchester. Um, but do some research ahead of time to figure out where you're gonna go. Make sure everyone in your group is wearing a reflective vest, every kid, every adult, not just one vest per group. And we really recommend if you can, a one-to-one -one adult to child ratio. And that's because if you have a group of three or four kids with, with just one adult with them, and they are so excited to see these frogs and salamanders, it can be really hard to um, reinforce what we need to do around safety. So enlist, um, enlist friends, neighbors, aunts and uncles, and um, have one adult for each child. And the primary responsibility of that adult is the safety and well-being of that child. Um, okay, so you've heard me mention site coordinators. I just wanna put a shout out for these special volunteers. And if any of you um, are returning volunteers that might consider this, we are always looking for site coordinators. These are folks that are kind of well-established crossings that are go-to volunteers, they're kind of super volunteers. So. Um, they, what do they do? The hardest thing really is that they stick around for the duration of salamander season and agree to go out if there's a migration. We try to line up more than one coordinator per site so that if one person is out of town or has something going on, there's someone to fill in for them. We don't have site coordinators for every site this year yet. Um, we are always looking for more. So reach out to us if this might be of interest to you. They familiarize themselves with the crossing site, where to park, whether it's family friendly, um, what kind of species that might be found there. They keep track of field equipment that we loan to them for the season. So salamander crossing signs, traffic cones, data forms. They greet you when you, um, when you come to their site, they might hand you a data form, they sign people in and out and they share that information with us. They can help you to identify amphibians. Um, and then at the end of the night, you can hand your data forms to them and they will collect all the counts from that site and get them to us in a timely fashion. So, um, Okay, another quick prop quiz. We have two species in this photo. Which one is the one on the ground? I hope you know this by now. Anybody in the spotted salamander? Which one is the one in the hands? These ones are grayish with blue flecking, the ones in the hands. Anybody recognize those? Those are, yeah, our Jefferson complex, our Jeff hybrids. Awesome, you guys got this. So what to expect on big nights? We've talked about this, but just to kind of sum it all up. So you're gonna sign up um, on our website to join our, um, to join our volunteer efforts. You're gonna sign our liability form, which we'll talk about in a minute. You're gonna be kind of waiting, watching the weather, checking the salamander forecast, checking your email. And then when, when it looks promising, you're gonna head out to the crossing site you've identified ahead of time as the place that's closest to you. Um, when you get there, you're gonna park safely. We have parking information on our website as well for our well-established crossings. If there is a site coordinator at your site, you'll know it because there'll be salamander crossing signs or traffic cones. And the site coordinator will be the person in the reflective vest that says Harris Center on the back in reflective letters. So when you get there, you're going to check in with them. They're going to hand you a data form if you need one. They'll kind of help you answer any questions about the site, um, record what time you were there. And then you and whoever's with you will start your salamander crossing. You'll walk slowly down um, the road, the side of the road, scanning, um, moving your flashlight back and forth, scanning for amphibians. You're looking for um, a triangular shaped rock. That's probably a frog or a stick with one end pointing up. That might be a salamander. Um, when you see one, you're gonna move it across the road, note it on your data form. It can be helpful to divide those tasks up. So one person is the data recorder and one person is the amphibian um, shuffler. And you're just gonna kind of do that. You're going to walk back and forth for as long as you want to be out there. Some people are there for 45 minutes. Some people stay out till two or three in the morning. The migration will continue all night long, as long as conditions are right. If it gets too cold, if it drops into the thirties or the rain stops and the road dries up, the an amphibian activity will slow as well. But if it's 45 degrees and raining all night, the amphibians will, will migrate all night too. And you can decide for yourself when it's time to leave. Um, and when you do leave, if you have a site coordinator, we ask that you check out with them. You let you give them your data, either handing them your form or verbally telling them your counts. 
Um, if you don't have a site coordinator, um, you're going to do that after you get home on our website. Um, and you're going to drive really slowly on your way home because there will probably be amphibians all over the road. Um, and when you get home, you will share your accounts and your photos with us. And um, you'll probably want to share your other photos with everyone you know, because it would have been an, it's an awesome night on the road. So um, this is Andrew. This is an old picture, but I love it because he's really demonstrating um, all the kind of key pieces of being out there. So he's got a reflective vest. This is an old fashioned one. Um, bigger, bigger reflective bands are better. He's got two sources of light, a headlamp and a flashlight. He's got a pencil clipped to his vest, ready to record data. He wears glasses, so he knows he needs a brimmed hat to keep the rain off his glasses so he can stay alert to traffic. He's holding a spring peeper. And you know, most importantly, except for the reflective vest, which is the most important, he is smiling. He's happy. He's having a good time. If you're not smiling anymore, it's time to go home. This is a low, um, low commitment volunteer effort. You come if you can, you stay as long as you like. And if you've reached the point where you're cold and miserable and tired, it's okay to go home for the night. There will be other nights. So um, in terms of crossing sites, how do you know where to go? We've got a map on our website um, and it's, 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 it's interactive map. You can click on any one of these, um, any one of these dots here, these, these icons, and it will give you more information. The yellow sites are the ones that are our well-established crossings. We've had um, data collection efforts going on there for a decade or more. You're very likely to find amphibians there. You're most, you're also likely at most of these to find other people. So if the, if you're new to this and you want to go out with other people, um, you can start at those sites. The white ones have been discontinued. Um, there are amphibians there, but there's also aggressive drivers or neighbors who are not supportive of the project. There's only two of those. And the majority of our sites are these green frogs. These are sites that have been reported to us by people like you. And so we might not be actively um, organizing volunteer efforts at every one of those. We're not trying to line up site coordinators for them. They won't have signs and cones, but they might have families or individuals who are going out to those places in their neighborhoods year after year. Um, we have widely varying um, levels of activity and also levels of information about those sites. So it's everything from a place where one family has gone out every year for five years and we know a lot about it, to a spot where someone said, hey, Brett, I saw a salamander on this road once. And my thought is to put them all up there, give you as much information as possible so that you can find sites as close to home as possible. The best thing to do on these nights is to drive as little as possible or not as all, not at all. And so we're trying to help you find places that are close to home to do crossings. Um, and um, because of that, even though we only actively can coordinate efforts in the Southwest New Hampshire and we manage data from within that area too, on our map, we um, include crossing sites that have been reported to us from all across the state in a way to, as a, a way to kind of be a matchmaker for volunteers and sites. So I'm gonna um, stop, I'm gonna change my screen share for a minute because I want to show you um, our website and uh, how to find this stuff on the website. So this is the Harris Center website right now. Um, in salamander season, this, this banner will be here and you can go straight to the salamander brigade page. But if, if it's not salamander season or, or if that banner changes, you can go up here to programs and educations, community science, salamander crossing brigades. This is where all this great information lives. So here's our map of crossing sites. Um, Every single one of these icons, you can click on that site and it will tell you some information about that site as much as we have. Some of them might be very detailed. It might be parking. It might be um, what kinds of species you'll find out there. And some of them, it might not be as much. And then our established crossing sites, these are also downloadable information about parking and that sort of thing. We also have the salamander forecast um, color-coded with more information. I'm kind of keeping a little bit of an eye on Thursday for places with bare ground, but Really, it won't get going, I don't think, until um, another week or two has passed. We have um, volunteer materials. This is really important because this is where you can find the volunteer handbook. This is where you can find our data forms. This is where you sign up to volunteer. That's really key. So we know how to get in touch with you. And we know that you want us to get in touch with you. Our liability waiver. This is also where you submit your data. Each of these opens up into a new window, um, uh, an online form for counts, photos, and reporting a new crossing site. 
And the last thing I want to point out is if you aren't local to us, we keep a, a running list of other crossing brigade programs in the Northeast to help you find the place that's closest to you. Each one of these has a link or some contact information to help um, you find other efforts all throughout the Northeast. So there's lots of us doing this. We're part of a whole network of people. And so you can find the one that is closest to you um, here. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back to my um, my PowerPoint screen because we have running a little low on time, and I want to make sure I get to some other stuff. So, and I also have time for questions. So here we go. That was crossing sites. So um, after all of that, what if you looked at that map and you still don't see any crossing sites next to you? What should you do? Um, you want to drive as little as possible. You don't want to be driving three hours to Keene to be at North Lincoln Street with some of us. So um, what should you do? And also a little pop quiz. What species do we have here? I hope you know this. This is our, our garden dweller, our wart, warty and stout friend. This is, anyone guessing? This is our American toad. You got it. Um, I did know, I did see that, um, I haven't looked at the questions yet because Karen's really monitoring, but the question about reporting data in Maine, there's a whole statewide Maine big night group where they do that over there. So if you are someone who lives in Maine or Vermont, connect with those local organizations and they um, they would love your data, I'm sure. Um, we, we are really New Hampshire based here for that sort of thing. Um, okay, so if there aren't any crossings, it's time for a road survey. You're going to go out and look for crossing sites on these nights. So you're going to do the same things that the rest of us are doing. You're watching the weather for the right conditions, 45 degree rain, thawed ground. You're going out after dark. You're looking for wetlands. So you're thinking about places in your town. Most of our crossing sites have a forested hillside on one side of the road and a wetland or lake or pond or vernal pool on the other. So think about places in your town that have that configuration, a forested hillside on one side and water on the other. That's where you start on these nights. You can also look at iNaturalist, which is a community science platform where people report observations and you can kind of look for spotted salamander or wood fog observations in your town that happen to be from near roads. That might be another sign of a crossing site. You're going to Recruit someone because one of you is going to drive and the other one is going to be looking for critters. It's also more fun that way. You're going to be slowing down to 15 miles an hour, uh, any roads near water or places that you suspect are crossings. You're going to turn the radio off and you're going to roll those windows down and listen for wood frogs and peepers because that might be a sign that you're nearing a crossing site. And then you're going to scan the whole road and you're not just looking for live amphibians. Um, in many cases, if its spot does not have crossing brigade volunteers, um, the dead ones will stay longer on the road. And so a good crossing site might be a, a spot with multiple casualties at first. Um, if it's safe, you will pull over and park. Please don't park in anyone's driveways or right in front of their houses. That can freak people out. Um, and then if you are ready for being on the road, you have your reflective vest, you have your rain gear, your flashlight, we have data forms that you can download for scouting out new crossing sites, and you can spend a little time there, see what you see. Um, our data forms have one side for location information, including parking and some other information around safety at that site, like are there sidewalks, are there street lights? And then the other side is just like our other forms, it's count data. Um, so you're gonna um, do that and then um, report, report them to us and we will add them to the map if they are good crossing sites. And if it's a really good site, feel free to go back there. You're up, you know, night after night, this might be your site that you just found in your town and you wanna be the, the, the family or the group of people for that site. Um, and you can adopt it and go, go for it. A um, Couple more um, short things I wanna just mention before we wrap up. Um, at some of our sites, we have a special project to record spot pattern um, information about spotted salamanders. So many people are um, don't know that the spot patterns on spotted salamanders are like fingerprints on people. Every individual has their own unique pattern. And so if you record that pattern, you can begin to tell whether you're seeing the same animals again and again. So we have this project that we started in 2014 to start photographing spot patterns. And so here's an animal that we saw on both its inbound and outbound migration. We started off, you can see these two um, spots that are kind of far apart on the left side of the body, then these two that are kind of attached, and then there's three at the base of the head. This is the same animal. So we um, 
have identified 35 individual salamanders just from North Lincoln Street and Keene that have been moved across um, by our volunteers on at least two different occasions. We're a little backlogged on data because it takes a long time to sort through these photos. So this is as of 2021, I think. We still have two, 2020. We still have a few years of data to look at. 24 salamanders that have been encountered in two or more years, not necessarily consecutively. One that was moved five years in a row, which is amazing. Um, so if you want to contribute to this project, this is kind of a bonus. Um, if there's a lot of critters on the road, it can be, um, you might not have time to, to photograph, but if you can, um, just spotted salamanders, they're the only ones with these unique markings. Um, we love to see and share pictures of all kinds of amphibians if you submit them uh, via our web form. But for this project, spotties only. Really only looking at this point for pictures from five of our well-established crossing sites, Jordan Road, North Lincoln Street, Swansea Lake Road, Matthews Road, which always needs more volunteer help, um, and Nelson Road. So the value here is that in looking at places year after year, and these are sites where we have good data sets already. So we're looking to build on those rather than branching out to other sites. You wanna photograph the head and the back from above and make sure both sides of the salamander are visible. So that's a sweet photo, but no good for spot patterns. Same thing here. This is what we want. And then if you submit multiple photos, we, uh, we need to know the date, we need to know the site. And if you're really savvy and you wanna rename your files and make things easier for us, you can also give a unique number um, for that animal for that night. So for instance, if this one was at Jordan Road on April 15th, 2018, and it was the first one that night, it's Jordan Road, 4-15-1801. The next one from that night would be 4-15-1802. Um, and if you're doing it from your phone, we need um, large or original size photos, not small or medium. Those won't be big enough for us to really look at the patterns. So um, last thing I want to end with, I know we're, we're getting short on time, but I want to share with you some of the successes that this project has um, achieved because of our volunteers. Um, and so the first, of course, is just the numbers of amphibians. We have now provided safe passage for more than 70,000 amphibians uh, since 2007, which is incredible. Some of those, as we saw from the spot pattern photos, might be the same animals, um, but it's 70,000 crossings. It's 70,000 chances at breeding. It's 70,000 chances at surviving another year. Um, and I also, um, in terms of the data, everybody, every year I, people ask me like, how are the salamanders doing? How is the population? How does this site compare to that site? And that is not a question that we really can answer with this data. If we wanted to know how the salamanders were doing, we would do what you can see in these photos, which is that we'd set up something called a pitfall array trap. And so that is basically a fence line that would be surrounding a breeding wetland or a vernal pool or a road. And so that when a salamander um, tried to cross, it would hit that fence, it would walk along that fence, it would fall into a pitfall trap, which is what this is and what this picture is, where it would wait until a highly caffeinated graduate student who was working through the night to process amphibians, um, checked that trap, took some um, information and measurements and released the salamander on the other side. And that's really the only way to know fu fundamentally like population sizes and how many amphibians are at a given site and how to compare one site to the other would be systematic um, systematic efforts like this. And um, it's really cool science and it's beyond the scope of what we can do. So um, we can't say how the salamanders of New Hampshire are doing, um, but the numbers tell a story that words can't tell. The data we collect matters. And here's my example of that. This is our North Lincoln Street site uh, many years ago now. Um, it, this is a, a piece of land where um, adjacent to the road and it was cleared and it was up for sale. And there was a plan to develop it, to put houses on it. And the Keene Conservation Commission was reviewing a permit to develop this site. And they had heard about our project and they asked me to come and um, talk with them. And they asked me, how important is this site for amphibians? How does it compare to other sites? And I said, well, I can't answer that um, because our data have limitations, but I can tell you that the other night in four hours, 25 volunteers moved 838 frogs across the road and they were all going onto that property on their way to the wetland. Um, those numbers are powerful. If I had said there were a lot of frogs out there, what's a lot? Is it 10? Is it 100? 
but 838 frogs in the span of only four hours. And by the way, 25 people who went out on a 43 degree rainy night um, and to help these animals because they cared, that's a powerful story. And so in this case, the land was not developed. And in fact, the city of Keene bought it uh, as conservation land because of its importance for migratory amphibians. 10 years later, and we are working with the city, we wor started working with the city of Keene to close this site to vehicles on migration nights, which was done, which was, which is a decision based in large part on the data collected by our volunteers and also on the commitment demonstrated by our volunteers that caring, the show um, of caring for these animals. Um, and last year we expanded that those closures to a second site at Jordan Road, where the only place in the entire state of New Hampshire that closes roads for migratory amphibians. So shout out to Keene for doing such a great thing here. Um, and that was that's the power of community science, and that is what our data have done. And that's why the counts matter. That's why sharing your data with the Harris Center so we can share it with community partners and researchers and, and start to think about ways to improve roads for wildlife um, in the future. We can't carry every frog across every road, but the data that you collect can help us um, make good decisions for amphibians in our communities. So really quick, some homework assignments for you. Sign up to volunteer on our website. Let us know you want to hear from us. Fill out the liability waiver. We have a volunteer handbook there. Check it out. It's a really great distillation of the most important stuff you need to know. You can download it there. There's also a great video there called Nature Minute that shows you what it's like on the road on a big night. It was filmed in New Jersey, um, so it's not local to us, but I think it does a really great job of just giving you a sense of what it's like out there if you've not been out. Um, and then gather your field gear, your reflective vest, find your flashlights, and let's get ready for big night. So I know we're, we're almost to the end, but I'm assuming that there are a few questions, Karen, um, that we might have time for one or two of the most important ones. So what I, do you think? I've been trying to tackle them, but one um, question that came up a lot that I wondered if you could talk to a bit was um, concerns about pathogen transference in handling the amphibians and uh, yeah. things like that's that. A bit, that's a great question. It's a growing um, area of concern because pathogens, um, diseases uh, are, are certainly um, having taking a big toll on amphibians, especially in warmer climates and may become more of a concern here with climate change. Generally, my sense is that these amphibians are all going um, to the same breeding pool together. And so they are perfectly capable of spreading pathogens to one another with or without us. And so you can wear gloves. Um, truly, if you were really worried about that, you'd need to swap your gloves out in between every amphibian. And that's not feasible, I don't think. So my sense is that it, it may be something, especially if you're at multiple sites in a given night, then maybe you'd want to swap gloves in between sites or wash your hands in between sites if it was possible. But if they're all going into the same wetland and they're all going to um, swim together and chorus together, I'm not super worried about disease transmission within um, single site populations because I think that they're, they might be spreading the disease to one another without, without our help just fine. Yes, I agree. Um, something that Denise brought up here that you touched on, but I think is worth uh, recapitulating a bit is Denise is asking about the, the inbound and then also the outbound migration. So I loved how she phrased this question. Does that mean we need to carry them twice? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, so we, we don't try to capture the entire outbound migration because that would extend well into May. And then if we were talking about the young of the year, so those eggs are laid in that vernal pool. Uh, larvae hatch out of those eggs. They they eventually become, if they're lucky, um, frogs or, or juvenile salamanders that also need to leave the pool at the end of the year, um, at the end of the warm season in the summer. So we're not really trying to capture every part of the migration. It's just not feasible. Um, but we do often, especially with wood frogs and spotted salamanders who only spend two to four weeks in that vernal pool or wetland, we do often capture some of their outbound migration. Um, and are carrying them twice. And that's great because we're helping them to get back to the woods to, to spend the rest of their year um, and hopefully in safety. So um, we're not trying to capture every single toad or gray tree frog or, you know, frogs are out on roads all summer long on every warm rainy night. So I encourage you just not to drive if you can help it on warm rainy nights, even if it's past the spring migration season. Um, 
but we do um, we we do get some of that outbound migration, yes, and, and towards the end of the season in late April and early May. For anyone who's thinking about doing this in your own communities, use our materials as a model, um, our volunteer handbooks, our data forms, um, our liability waiver. Any of that is our, we want to help create crossing brigade efforts, even in places where we don't work. And so, please feel free to use what you can from us and to reach out to Karen or I um, for more information about any of that. Um, we're very happy to, um, to talk with people who, who want to get these going in their own necks of the woods. Um, the more, the better, as far as I'm concerned. So we had one that one late question and then maybe we can wrap it up after this one, but Emily was asking about how busy is, a, is a, does a road have to be to be too busy to be a potential crossing mm -hmm. site? For traffic or vehicle traffic. Yeah, that's a great question. So we're generally looking for, for roads where there's enough traffic where our efforts will make a difference, but not so much traffic that it's a serious safety concern. Um, I would say for sure, no four lane roads. Um, and then even some two lane roads that have speed limits of 50 mile, 55 miles an hour or up um, are probably on the edge. Um, and then of course, traffic volume, you know, and safety is somewhat of a relative thing. So some people might feel comfortable um, on these roads that don't have shoulders or don't have lighting, um, and other people don't feel comfortable there. So, um, it's sort of a matter of, to some extent, it's a matter of, of, of personal comfort. And that's, we try to provide as much information as we can. We just upgraded our, our kind of crossing location, reporting a new crossing site data form to include some of that safety information so that we can provide it for people to make their own decisions about that. But four lane highways for sure, no good. Um, and, and, and roads with, where cars are moving more than 55, 50 or 55 miles per hour, probably also no good. Um, other than that, it's a, it's a traffic volume question. And that also can vary quite a bit based on time of night. Um, and what night of the week it is. And, and so there might be times when it feels safer than other times. Please drop us a line, check out information at harriscenter.org. We have so much good information there for you. And um, we hope that you will join us out there for our next rainy night. So thank you everybody. And um, yeah, go get your reflective vest. <laughs>